Hi, again, it's Mark Wilkinson. Thank you for joining IBEX Utilities Digital Transformation Series. Today, we're going to be talking about keeping the customer at the center of digital transformation. Joining me again is Jay Gore, a technology guru and implementation specialist who's been involved with some of the most customer-obsessed brands in the world, including the launch of the original iPhone. Jay, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me back, Mark. Excited to be here. Jay, remind for the listeners how you got involved in the the digital uh, implementation and technology world. Yeah, I spoke a little bit on the on the last series um, about my my start with the iPhone and how amazing that was, and ha- getting to do the first three iPhone launches, which were all very different from each other, including uh, a unique activation experience where you brought the phone home and tethered it to your computer and went through a series of choices and then lit it up. Uh, that was you know kind of groundbreaking for the industry and um, certainly interesting to see how that evolved over the first three years, but I've been involved in some other large efforts. Um, My my company has continued to acquire and merge and divest and um, have been a part of lots of big transformation projects, including um, DTV and bringing bringing that on board and some other mergers and acquisitions. And um, I've always enjoyed kind of learning about other, what other folks are doing and bringing that into the, the world that I su- support. Um, and I feel like I bring kind of a, I'm, I'm, I'm a translator at, at best. I, I have the technology speak and experience, um, but I also have kind of the human element in, in what we do. And um, I've enjoyed bringing those two things together and working on some, some really amazing and, and big trans- transformative projects. Excellent. Well, thanks. Actually, the last time we were together, you you had a lot to say about uh, you know the psychology of leaving those projects and the importance of keeping the the customer's perspective in in flow. Um, so I appreciate you being able to join us again today and take that to, that topic and conversation to the next level. So today, Jay's going to be helping us with a view of why we lose sight of the customer and why it's so hard to maintain the customer perspective. We're going to talk about what it means to be customer obsessed and how big companies can tackle some of those challenges. And then finally, Jay's going to give us some thoughts and insights on um, advice for project owners and technology managers and and, uh, stakeholders for how to find that balance um, in executing these projects between the the needs of the business and, and the concerns of the customer's perspective. So Jay, you and I have talked for years about this notion of of maintaining the user or the customer's perspective at the center of these projects, because even if you're successful with certain features or capabilities, if the customers ultimately don't use the products or services or solutions, then really we haven't built what's what's important. Why do you think it's, it's so difficult or why do you think we lose track of the customer's perspective in these big technology projects? It's a great question, and I know it's something that folks in our world struggle with all the time. You know, I I think um, a a lot of teams get focused on the function and forget about the format, keeping the customer facing things simple um, and watching how you're sequencing your flows and your API calls behind the scenes is always important. Um, And it's always, it's always good to look for ways to decrease, you know, your response times on those API calls. And to maybe even simplify your calls where you're um, kind of uh, looking for efficiencies in the questions that you ask, how you collect information, and how you pass that on page to page is always important. You have to keep the customer's perspective in mind. And I think in any business, uh, it, spe- specifically with digital, you're always talking about time and simplicity and keeping those things at the forefront are very important. Yeah, I remember in the early days of e-commerce, especially for challenging e-commerce, like finding services that were attached to an address or a consumer directly, there were were a lot of companies that were trying to verify and, and smooth out big operational projects. I remember having a conversation with a product owner once where they were so proud of the fact that by, you know, after four of these cycles of, unusual questions that customers had to go through in a checkout, they had screened out 97% of the 
of the obstacles to implementation. In other words, the checkout had these four weird questions and if customers answered all four of them, 97% of the problems to, to activation could be ironed out. And, and I brought up the fact that that's great, but after two of these questions, 100% of my customers have abandoned my site and they're calling to under, to, you know, they're calling a contact center or a customer support rep to, to figure out what's going on. Um, and, and it was a really stark example in the early days of e-commerce, uh, you know, that was very engineering oriented versus very customer oriented. And now it does feel like we're, we're seeing the, 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 the flow move in the other direction, you know, big customer brands customer obsessed brands like Amazon, like Apple, like Best Buy, like Southwest, they've all reached a high bar. Um, from, from your perspective, you know, what are the structural challenges? What are the organizational challenges that, that keep, keep every company from, be, from making it easy on themselves? Mm, that's, a, that's a good question too. Um, you know, I think, I think you kind of hit on it a bit there's a there's a very fine balance between um, the ease of an application and not driving cost to, to some other place in your business. If you eliminate those four questions, does it generate a phone call? How much does that phone call cost? How many customers are you losing in the top of the funnel? These these are all really tricky questions, and I think that's why a lot of the companies that we work with, and and even you know within our own organizations are always looking at kind of doing A, B testing, uh, A, B, C, D, E testing, really, to find out which flows work the best, um, which flows create engagement, and kind of um, what are the best ways to collect data and collect the required elements in order to sell whatever service or function you're selling, but at the same time, not moving costs from one place to another. I think it's a very difficult challenge but there are folks that do it very well. And I always, um, it's not lost on me that data is usually the key to unlocking the success of all of that complication. Yeah, that's a great point. It's always easier and better to bring facts to the table to make decisions than, than, um, than the whim or maybe, you know, individual feedback. We've always, we use the expression N of one, right? I'm, the, I'm an N of one. And this is my experience too often that takes over. Um, I think you and I have talked a little bit before about the role that engineering plays in the customer perspective and the challenge for right or wrong. Engineering doesn't, they get a lot of blame. Some of it deserves, most of it not. Um, but that engineering culture or a technology um, uh, culture can sometimes overwhelm the, the sort of the customer perspective. Um, and you've been in the role of really driving these projects as a as a project manager and as a project owner. You know, how do you balance those things? How do you how do you be sh make sure that each kind of silo of team, um, you know, has has that customer's perspective front and center in the process? Well, you know, I think um, I think one of the things I, I would talk about. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I've had, a, I've had a chance to work with some amazing PMs. I was just kind of in my head a little bit thinking about some of the folks that I've worked with and what, you know, what they do really, really well. You know, I think most of the successful PMs um, and folks that, that stay focused on the customer always start their status calls with all of their stakeholders with a reminder about what the impact of this effort is on the customer and the customer's impact on the revenue. Keeping it simple like that um, reminds everyone, you know, kind of what you're there for. And it also keeps the financial folks happy. You know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to drive revenue um, and you need customers to do that. So that, that's the most successful trick that I've seen. Um, and, you know, it, it, just, it keeps everybody singing the same song. And then when they're discussing kind of the uh, overall effort with their leadership, it's a simple talk track um, and everybody is saying the same thing. And it, you know, it's important that uh, as, as a PM that you are kind of going out and using the tools that you're asking your customers to use so that at its very basic, you've got that perspective and you've got that kind of um, hands-on understanding of what it is that you're putting your customers through and bringing that back to the project, I think, um, 
you know, pr provides some, a good grounding on perspective. Yeah, that's, that's great insight. I don't hear it often enough when I'm, I'm talking to product leaders is, is the importance of having everybody, you know, play the role of the customer. I, I don't think there's a better mantra um, than that in, in a lot of projects. So Jay, you've worked on the, the launch of the original iPhone. You've worked with some of the most customer obsessed brands. I, I think of DirecTV's ex, uh, user experience and, and um, remote control experience as being cutting edge right from the very beginning. Um, talk to me about some of the experiences working with these giant brands and the experience you had, especially with the iPhone in terms of you know what the difference is for these big customer obsessed brands and how they stay so focused. Yeah, it may sound obvious, but I think they're all very data driven. Um, it's really, it's not just th that simple. Um, you know, data can be used in a bunch of interesting ways, depending on what group um, you're talking about. Marketing uses their data differently than, um, than development, uh, you know, and so having that kind of foundation um, I think it has driven the success of the companies that you've talked about, but at the same time, making sure that that data is accessible across all of the applications that support that ecosystem of sales is important. Some of the most successful companies that I've seen um, are have the ability to tie all of that data back to the sales flows. The sales flows are tied to, you know, sales data and rep training, um, customer data is shared across all of those properties so that for any one customer, you know, you know the propensity to buy, you know when they'll buy, what they'll buy, um, and making sure that the exchange of that information is secure, but that it's shared with all of the groups that impact, you know, kind of the customer along, along the path is really one of the most um, important keys to success. Yeah, it sounds like company, it sounds like data sort of sets you free a little bit, right? It breaks down a lot of barriers in terms of um, how, the, how people working in various silos within the project might interpret things, right? Because if, if, if you're the, if your role is the product project owner or program manager or product owner, um, you've got resources that cut across, whether it's just dev or marketing or product support and customer service, you've got data that can show people the, the truth about the customer experience at any of those interactions or any of those levels, right? Yeah, and there's, you know, there's a fine line between creepy and efficient. And <laughs> that's something that <laughs> something that these big brands have to deal with all the time. Myself, as a consumer, I don't mind answering a few more questions if the next time I'm on that site or the next time I'm engaged with one of their products it makes it easier for me to do something um, as long as, you know, the data is stored and secured properly. That's something I'm willing to give up as a customer. I think most folks are. Yeah. You, you know, it strikes me the, the logos that we've got on this page are all, all companies that um, rank high in, in customer sat and, in, and uh, being very customer focused on all of the, you know, Forbes lists and, and other lists that float around the world. It strikes me as you say that, and th this is just a thought that just came to me, but every one of these customers, every one of these brands rather, um, is constantly polling their customer base one way or the other. If they've got data on my purchases, they've got data on maybe how long I'm in the application, they've got data on what I'm doing, but they're also asking me questions, right? I get I get uh, the surveys after a, a flight, I get an in-app note, uh, you know, when I, when I buy my chicken sandwich, certainly all of my Apple products, I get a lot of in-stream um, data that I can feed back to them or surveys that pop up on my screen. It does seem like these companies go above and beyond in terms of listening to their customers in different ways, right? They, they do. And I, you know, like, like you said, m most of the ones that are up there are, are built on repeat business. These aren't you know, one sale and done kind of trades. Um, these are these are brands that appreciate their customers for the most part um, and listen um, to your point. And like I said, I don't I don't mind giving up a little bit of information if it makes my engagement with their brand and their products easier. 
Yeah, it's a great advice, great great opportunity to really for 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 companies to lean in and, and copy some of these practices that the the the, the big customer obsessed brands are following. Well, Jay, if you were a new if you had a, a room full of new project leaders or um, maybe product owners who are trying to find a balance between keeping the customer at the center of their of their program, but also they've got you know maybe a board or a CFO or or um, you know sales teams breathing down their neck. How, how what suggestions do you have for for people in those roles to find a balance between success and and progress? Hmm. Well, d- delivery, 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 right? I mean, I think it's all, <laughs> that's the top three. Um, it's all about delivering on your, you know, your features and epics and, um, and, pro- and, and projects and making sure that those things that you're delivering are either creating an efficiency like we talked about um, or creating revenue or both. And that you're kind of staying within the um, scope and expectations of the original effort. Um, you know, I, t- tying this back to kind of uh, agile, you know, delivery and, and things like that. I, I've always, um, I've always found it easier to do kind of like agile flex, um, where you're, you've got, you've always got items in your kind of um, development repertoire that, um, you know, some are focused on buy flow. Some are focused on things that are not optical um, where they're, you know, kind of back end efficiencies and, and changes like that. Um, and then some, some are, um, you know, both or um, customer, customer facing kind of things and making sure that you're deploying those equally and equitably, I think is always good advice, not getting too heavy in scope or scale on one side or the other of those things is important. Because like you said, at the end of the day, if you want, especially if you want to deliver, uh, you know, a long-term integration or a long-term digital transformation, you're going to need investment. And the way that you're going to get investment is by delivering incremental results um, and making sure that things in either of those buckets, you know, always keep the customer in mind because that's what generates revenue. But at the same time that you're doing it, you know, kind of with with financial maturity um, and an impact to the bottom line. I may not have answered your question directly, but that's what kind of came to mind when I was thinking about that. No, I, I, I love the idea of finding that balance you know, between the customer and the business or, or the progress, you know, making progress and, and achieving longer term success. And you just defined it really nicely as, you know, between the sort of the, the practical and the, ta- and the ideological, right? We know the customer has got to be in balance with the, with the practical needs of the business. And I would, I, I, I would say, I loved your, your reference to, you know, balancing stuff that's customer facing maybe in the UX or um, CX layer, but also in the back end, sometimes those back end efficiencies are just as important to the overall, you know, customer experience as, as stuff that we spend a lot of time in the design shop doing, right? You, you, there's, there's a, there's an interplay between, you know, eliminating three steps in the back office and that's, that may save an entire step or two in the customer experience and customers just more intuitively will get it, right? It solves a lot of design problems when you can work that stuff out. Yeah, you don't want to ask the same question twice, and you want to be sensitive <laughs> to the amount of time it takes to get through a given page. Well, as always, Jay, great advice. I, uh, I hope that uh, everybody on this uh, session is, is able to catch all this wisdom from you, and if not, they can certainly review on demand. Um, I always ask a, a question at the end of a series, and uh, just just for more fun than anything else, but Jay, what are you most looking forward to in a post-vaccine sort of next normal world? Wow. Um, well, I'm getting my first shot this week, um, so I'm starting to feel better about doing that exactly. I think for, for me, Mark, it's about family and friends. I, I miss the social aspect of, um, you know, just being able to 
go over to someone's house and hang. I, I'm a music guy. I'm in a band. So, you know, being able to get together with my buddies and, and have that, um, you know, kind of shared experience is, is something I'm looking forward to, but mostly seeing my family back in Texas, it's been almost, um, a year and a half, maybe even almost two years since I've seen my folks. So I'm, I'm ready to hug some necks and, um, and get some handshakes and just really kind of get back to the, the human aspect of things. I couldn't have said it better. Well, thank you very much, Jay. And for those of you who want to get in touch with Jay, please click the link to his LinkedIn page. Um, Jay's a, Jay's a, um, a polymath in many ways. He's, he's got uh, incredible experiences and is always willing to share. We appreciate him being a part of our utility podcast series. So next up in the digital transformation series, we're going to be spending some time talking about leveraging technology to overcome some of the COVID uncertainty in the world. And so I hope you'll join us next time. Thanks again, Jay. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Always fun.